Great, Jet, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for Indeed. having me. Absolutely. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot off and, and leave you to it. I'm gonna talk a bit about bed bug chemical ecology and yeah, I'm excited about that. So please I will leave you to it. Yeah. Thank you thank very you. much and thank you for letting me having this opportunity. Uh I will start to share my screen. Uh, there we are. There we go. It's popped up. Fabulous. So there you are. Uh Bed bug chemical ecology, is that something that we can use uh, in the battle against bed bugs? And as Sharon said in the previous presentation, there are often more than one answer to, to most questions and the same pertains to, to bed bugs. So I will go through something about chemical ecology in general, just a little, and then I will go more into depth with bed bugs and what we, what we know and what we can do but potentially. Chemical ecology is the study of interactions between, between organisms and their environment that are mediated by natural occurring chemicals. And the two, these are the signal chemicals or semiochemicals, which are biofunctional molecules that spread information among individuals. And there are two major groups, pheromones, that are used to communicate with inner species. And just one of those you may uh, very well know are sex pheromones that signal, signal the presence of a mate, alarm pheromones, danger, aggregation pheromone uh, signal cut specifics, and contact pheromones also cut specifics. And pheromone, the word means that it carry uh, information that steer up or excite the uh, organism that receives it, but it, this is within species. And examples from usage of pheromones in pest management is like mating disruption and mass trapping in stored product pests, such as here, the Indian meal moss. Where females, female moss uh, emit sex pheromones and uh, the males, they get kind of crazy and they are trying to follow up where the females are and uh, uh, you can disrupt that their ability to find the female by display put in uh, dispensers with pheromones that are similar to the one the female uh, have and then they will not know which one is the uh, real one and which one is is just a dispenser and if you put up several uh, you make it even more disturbing or confusing for the males but you may also use the same pheromone, the female pheromone, to mass trap males uh, if you have a, a good trapping system for that. So that is mass trapping and mating disruption where it's well known uh, to be used. Allelochemicals, which when we communicate between species, like here, a beautiful flower and a, a carpenter bee, the floral scent of the flower attract the bee from a distance and closer up it's a color that takes over the bee gets nectar and pollen uh, visiting the flower and so they both are satisfied with, with that but this is communication between two different species uh, defense substances like the stink bug uh, it emits if it gets in danger it emits a horrible stinking substances and that's probably those that we know most defense substances but coming to bed, bed bugs, it is very important that we know something about, about the biology of the organism that we are going to try to manipulate using its own biology, or here in this case, uh, pheromones and uh, semiochemicals. And bed bugs, they are ectoparasite, meaning that they do not live on their host, but only visit when they are having a blood meal, which is what the only thing they live from. And they have usually humans as host, those species that we are dealing with. They aggregate near to the host, uh, that is near to the food also. They proportionally spend most active time during the night. And also they shy the light. Uh, and one thing that you have to keep in, in mind, that is they cannot fly. Uh, if you look at the flaps on the upper part of the uh, abdomen, that's a 
remnants of the wings that they had once earlier uh, in during evolution. So they have they can only crawl and uh, run. And also they have a flattened body that fits them well into crevices and uh, also uh, making them very difficult to, to find. And that is also connected to the, that they are tigmotactic. They, they like to be in contact with uh, surfaces or like here, they are in a, uh, a Caucasian in the lower photo. They want to be in contact with each other. And then cryptic behavior, that means that they don't want to uh, stay out in the open and be seen. So if they are out, then they will try to get away uh, and get into something that has a similar color or something. And how may we use uh, chemical ecology in, uh, in bed bug battle? We have the allochemicals and the bed bugs. For host location, the host have some chemicals it sends out that use by the bed bugs, and then you have pheromones within bed bugs. Unfortunately, the usually most successful pheromones that have been used in, in uh, monitoring or mass trapping and so are sex pheromones, but they have not been found or identified in bed bugs. And it's not because there have been there has been done many, many attempts, but apparently they do not have any. But they have aggregation pheromones, they have lamb pheromones, and perhaps also uh, trail pheromones. And then I have one also, a resman that I haven't put in here. It's, uh, that doesn't matter. So how do they detect all these volatile chemicals that are uh, maybe used? They do it by the antennae. The bed bug nose is the antennae. Uh, and that's the organ that perceives the chemicals. Uh, and in bed bugs, the outer two segments uh, that are, the outer distal segment is shown in an uh, extent, in an enlargement to the right. There are a lot of uh, sensory sen olfactory sensilla uh, or hairs there, and they are of different types. So each type may have uh, a specific uh, receptor for a specific or a few specific chemicals. Uh, and the volatiles need to go to, to get onto the antennae to be detected. And if we go to host location that was between uh, two different organisms or two different species, then you have human being sleeping, it's exhaling uh, carbon dioxide, which is an activator of uh, bed bugs. They, when they get this signal, they know there is some kind of food uh, close by. And then they start to run around. And uh, when they get in close contact uh, with the human, uh, they may be able to uh, use a sweat of human scent and heat uh, to, to, to attract them at close range. And this sounds simple, uh, but I'll just show an experiment here that's also very simple and uh, explicatory. You have a white tube olfactorometer, that's a common way of uh, testing chemicals in, in chemical ecology and for their function. You have the lower part of it uh, where you introduce the, the, in this case, bed box, and then you have after the uh, Y, you have one arm to the left and one arm to the right. And it's said here, odor part on both. In one of them, you come in papers that are uh, without any scent. And in the other, in this case, they use skin swaps from the humans and comes into the other arm of the Y. And then you have an airflow over both the control and the skin swap uh, that goes down to where the bed bugs are introduced. And they are left there for a certain amount of time where they are allowed to move along and they move up. And then if they end up past the uh, broken line in one of the arms, it's recorded as reacting either to the skin or to the control swap. Uh, and what they got uh, of results from this very simple test is that male and mated females and nymphs, they react uh, very strongly to the uh, skin swap, whereas unmated females, 
they did not have any reaction to this. So this is one of the places where you say there's not one answer to a, a question. It depends on the physiological state of, of the uh, uh, and, uh, organism that you're, you're working with and uh, many other things, most likely. So, and, and here we had a laminar, we have a air stream that pass over what we are seeing and it stays within the glass tube. So it's, it's reaching the, the bedrock and it can easily follow it upstream. And I will come back to that a little later. Because having, knowing what compounds are in the skin swab or in other uh, compounds that have been uh, identified from humans, uh, about 800 different compounds, and that's quite a few to, um, to choose from. But then you can go in on the insect antennae and test each individual compound uh, by inserting a uh, kind of electrode into a, a single sensillum and expose it to the <clears throat> scent that you want to test. Like here you have non anal heptanol, and ammonia, octanol, and the one T3D scenes. These are human compounds. And after you have half a minute of uh, exposure, and then you get a wood of uh, peaks or uh, structure. Yeah, not peaks, but uh, what do you say? A signal uh, that is stronger or, or less strong, depending on the, how they react to the different chemicals. And if you look at the, the two for non anal, that is one is inserted into the uh, D gamma uh, sensory sensillum, and one is inserted into the D alpha sensory sensillum. And, and in these, you, you get about similar re results, but it could have been like if you had had it into the E1 sensillum, you would not have gotten any uh, reaction for, for non anal. So each of these here may be more or less specific, but usually quite specific for, and it's a huge job to, 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 to test all these compounds. And then you still don't know uh, which one are positive or which one is negative influencing bed bugs, because you only know that they are active or they have receptors for them. Uh, so it seems perhaps, uh, promising that you you use it and you can screen and get fewer compounds, uh, but still you have a lot to choose from. And then you have to test it in, in real life also. Here we went to Richard Naylor. Uh, you may know him. He's one of the uh, most well-known uh, bedbug researchers in, in the UK and Europe. He built a cottage in, on the border to Wales and uh, so he could do almost like field studies in bedbug uh, ecology, but under controlled conditions. And he here, this is an experiment of host location uh, where he has a, the bed in the room there. And then he places bedbugs on a filtering paper, ten, usually 10 uh, on each time he releases. And when he sleeps in the uh, room, the bedbugs start to move around and they are searching and, and uh, trying to, they get an uh, impression, they get activated by the exhaling air of, from uh, Richard Naylor, the carbon dioxide that activates them to start to search for food. But if the room is unoccupied, you look at the right side, they hardly move, they just, they can stay on the paper uh, for several days because there's no signal telling them that they are, uh, there's food in the vicinity. And we saw, if you go, just go back, they are moving, seems, and is probably random that they are moving around. And it comes from that when you are following an odor of plume, uh, then here is an example from a, a study by uh, Rigoli et al, not, not of bedbugs, but just took the pictures because it wants to show how odors are moving in the air. You have on the top view, you see the odor plume from the emitting point, the orange uh, dot, that it's kind of moving to the sides. And if you see it from the side view, you see it also getting broader. And then if you go down to the lower 
in uh, in sir uh, you you kind of get a kind of a cone of detection so but if you are a bed bug that do not uh, move in three dimension but only in two dimension then you will only be able to follow it on the if you look in the side view on the very floor of that picture. So there'll be several times where there's no odor uh, and there'll be several times also where there are odor, but each time it's missing the odor, it's trying, it's going to turn around and move around. And so it's trying to capture the odor plume again. And that makes this uh, becoming or looking similar random. Uh, eventually uh, it, will get in closer contact with the uh, emitter and, and get up and, and uh, get in contact and get a, a food from, uh, from Richard in the bed. <clears throat> if we go to, that was earlier, that was the emission from people uh, or the host. If we go in between, in within the species and look at the pheromones, then on the adults in the, picture to the right, you have uh, two scent glands just in the upper part of the abdomen uh, under the wing pads. And uh, it's produced especially trans 2 hexanol and trans 2 octanol plus additional compounds in, in minor amounts. And it may, uh, if you go to where the legs are inserted on, on the bed bug, uh, that is where the pheromones is oozing out. And if it's not excited or if it's not disturbed or something, it's just like, then it comes out small amount, but if it's uh, disturbed, then high amounts are exuded and uh, it functions as a alarm pheromone. But just when it's at peace and so on, just moving around, uh, you will have low concentration. And then it's the aggregation pheromone, which is an attractant. So, we have a, a, a concentration dependent uh, pheromone, high concentration, it becomes alarming and low concentration, it becomes attractive. And uh, so that makes things not a bit more difficult with, with bed bugs. It's, and then in addition, NIMS have two additionally, uh, they have other, they have their scent glands on the dorsum of the abdomen. And they have two compounds that are not found in 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 the, the adults, and that is to protect them from, about from uh, raping by uh, by the male, because they don't have any kind of uh, protection. Uh, let's see. Here we have newly fed bedbugs, the small red ones, and you have uh, nymphs, uh, first instar nymphs, and you have uh, the base light yellow ones, uh, unfed first instar nymphs, and then you have a huge extended uh, female that had fed quite a good meal here and some eggs just to show. But these, the spots on the paper uh, are uh, the feces from the bed box that they exude uh, when they have eaten. And usually you get black spots immediately after they have eaten because they want to get rid of excess liquid. And what do they do these, what do they use these uh, um, dotted, uh, dots or um, hybrid scent for, uh, or aggregation scent? Here you have a picture from after a night that Richard Naylor slept in his cabin, and it's a clean cabin, so there's no uh, dots before he releases the bed box and so, so they have no cue of where to go, so they move around and they may have fat and so on. And then the following morning, he finds uh, two on the cushion uh, when he takes up the blind. They're just sitting there openly. They didn't know where to go. And then you have to the left, some that, uh, three that found together in one of the seams of the bed and you have some trying to leave and you have one by the skirtings. And so they, they don't have a cue to where they have conspecifics uh, or where they should go. And that is, uh, what I will talk about now, the aggregation pheromone that attracts conspecifics and mates to the uh, harbors or the uh, net, nest where the bed bugs are uh, resting between meals and what they else do. 
taking like you saw the filter paper above with a lot of dots on and so and extracting it with organic solvent and then identifying uh, or try to identify what is in it. Uh, you have the upper trace here, the blue trace. This is from a, it's a gas chromatogram uh, where each compound has been separated from the other. Uh, the compounds have been separated from each other. So each peak, each of the uh, blue peaks represent a compound that are in the uh, ex uh, extract of the paper where the bed bugs have been living. And that's a huge amount of uh, compounds. And then at the lower track, how should you choose from all these which are important and which may just be have no uh, information, no info chemicals and so. But by using a technique, um, DCEAG, you connect here, you have to take the head and make a circuit uh, over the antenna. And when you have a, it is exposed to a compound uh, that it has receptors for, you get a, a drop in the electrical potential and uh, you get these dips in the black curve below the blue one. So each of these dips is where you have a um, receptor for that specific compound. And those that showed, were shown to have uh, receptors uh, the compounds are named 1 to 21 in the upper trace of the GC uh, in the gas chromatogram. Uh, what should we do with 21 compounds? That's quite a lot. Uh, and also to get them in the right amounts. And we don't know what individual compounds means. And so, so uh, we took another uh, approach, looking and thinking more about the biology of the bed bugs because we learned from Richard Naylor from his thesis, uh, where he found looking into several different populations that usually you have these distinct harborages with, uh, uh, with bed bugs in, and he uh, did the effort to count how many were in each of these aggregations and found that around 30, 32 on average, uh, adult bed bugs were in each aggregation. Then it was, it could be many names and adult uh, names and eggs and so in, in the aggregation and uh, started to think how how do they know how many there are in a uh, aggregation and how do they know when to to move on uh, and try to make a new one or, or go somewhere else uh, they can't count but okay they can use the antennae and sniff uh, because if you have many bed bugs you have a stronger scent if you have less you have a weaker scent and we took that a step further uh, in an investigation and set up an experiment where we uh, produced populations with different densities with 18 of 244 bed bugs, uh, similar numbers of uh, males, females, and names in each population. And then did uh, collect the scent over a week passively without disturbing the bed bugs and their doings in the populations there. And after we collected the adsorbent, <clears throat> the uh, black stuff on top of the netting uh, over the uh, colony, uh, over each colony and uh, uh, extracted what had been absorbed to, to, to that. And then uh, identified the compounds and looked and compared between these different densities, which compound seemed to follow the pattern or have do something that did not follow the pattern, which one were interesting and and uh, which were not. And we ended up uh, with a, a blend of five different compounds that, uh, oh, before that we have tested extremely many, but five compounds seems to uh, elicit, uh, elicit reaction in in both males and female bed bugs and we did some in some clean arenas where we had below the arena the scent with the five compounds were inserted and we have two controls and noticed here uh, we did not have the holes or the wells open uh, we put a watch glass over during the first many experiments we didn't have that and we did not really get in much response that's probably because, and you will show, I will show later, the scent 
did not get down to where the bed bugs are because they are not, they are on the arena, not about the arena. But what we got is that uh, about an average of six of uh, uh, ten, the ten females released in each uh, replicate were attracted to the uh, scent lure, and for males it was uh, five point two on average that were attracted to the to the lure. So quite a good score compared to the controls. But this is a very artificial uh, and a very sterile environment. And then we took it to some seminatural con conditions uh, where we had 55 liters containers, where we put in some wood stocks and uh, fabric. And then we have a trap with the learn and a trap with the control. And we run experiments for over three weeks. And uh, 10 bed bugs, five me males and five me females were introduced at the beginning of week one and were removed after one week and then 10 new bed bugs uh, were introduced and so forth until uh, the fourth week after, uh, after week three was finished. And what we found, the distribution of the bed bugs uh, was that the Blue ones are the alert traps, and the orange one is the control trap. That there were always significantly during this period of time more bed bugs going into the alert traps than into the controls. And uh, even though they have other uh, things they could go to, and they did, uh, because we only captured about half of what we released uh, in the traps, or about six to seven, including the controls. So it was a, quite a good. Uh, we were quite happy with the results. So, but this is not all, because we have to consider uh, the design uh, of the traps, how the odor is spread. Uh, as I showed you, you had the watch glasses over the wells in the round arena, and we had to have that before we started to get results. And with the trap that are used in this experiment, you have a hole that is kind of forcing the scent down towards the surface where the bed bugs are, are moving. If you don't have the holder, you can see on the right uh, picture that the scent seems to move much more straight up and not get in contact with the uh, substrate where the, or the floor where the bed bugs are moving. So that is something I think we could learn a lot from, uh, that we have to have the scent where the bed bugs are moving. I have to consider that. And also the placement of the traps, uh, where do we place them? I showed this picture with the uh, air plumes, how they are moving, odor plumes, how they are moving, and so with the air. But even under the bed, you have not so much movement, air movement, like here, you <clears throat> some dusty things under my bed. And that means also uh, the scent will not be moved very far. So you have to think, where do the bed bugs uh, move around in, in the surroundings? And the first place they usually, or nine, to, or nine out of 10 cases, is that they are in the bed. So a good place is between the mattresses uh, to place a trap with, with the lure, or along the, uh, with, with by the bed legs, which is where if they come over the floor, the beds, bed bugs are getting into the bed. and long skirtings in dark places or dark places in general, but they like to follow uh, the circumference of the room, not, not just going straight over. Uh, so that are some things to consider. So in summary, bed bugs can only move along surfaces. They do prefer uh, dark places, and they seem to have a preference to move upwards. Some studies have shown like moving upwards on the bed legs. They are activated by uh, carbon dioxide. So it's good to keep people staying in a room if you want to trap them, uh, because then they will move more around. And also if you have other treatments, uh, like when you have residuals that you want them to go through, if they're just sitting, stay put, uh, they will not get in contact to, uh, with poison or diatomaceous or so what you, you use. So it's very good to have uh, the, them activated by carbon dioxide in the exhale of, of humans. 
or potentially also uh, artificial. Bedbugs are attracted by both host and aggregation odors. Uh, the host means food, and aggregation means uh, co uh, conspecifics and partners. And also, bedbugs can de detect heat at a, a, a close range. And usually, new infestation is established close to the host resting place, often the bed, but also so far armchair, some places where he or she stays slow. And use this inf information on bedbug behavior to determine where to look for them and where to place monitoring devices and traps. And that how you can use allochemicals and pheromones for monitoring with constant surveillance to detect new introductions and small infestation and to evaluate has a treatment been successful. Mass trapping, as I showed in the beginning for mass, uh, doesn't work uh, with bed bugs. They, the way they are moving, and there are too many odors already present. If you have a large infestation, uh, you can smell if you have many bed bugs in a place. So that will be of little, little or no use. So thank you for your attention. And uh, do you have questions? You are very welcome. Great, thank you, Jet. That was that was perfect. Good timing. We've got we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah. Um, a oh, couple of them are similar, so I'll 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 bunch them together. Um, the graph that you showed in Richard Naylor's cabin with the bed bugs moving around, they've got different colours um, yeah. associated with the lines. Is there, is there any significance to that, or is it just uh, so you can separate the the individuals? It's to separate the individuals. Great. I thought I thought yeah. I thought that'd be the case. But yeah, some people are like, yeah. oh, what are the colours for? Is it a, yeah, a particular no, that's one? Ten, ten individuals, and then you have different colours on them uh, ah. to see what is what. Uh, Fabulous. Yeah. I mean, it was <laughs> Cymex lectularis that was used in the study, was it? The uh, it was, this was lectularis, but lectularis. Uh, quite many of the same things pertain to uh, to uh, hemipterus, but we do not know so much uh, about aggregations in uh, hemipterus as we do in uh, lectularia so there mm -hmm. are things to go and study yeah more things for richard to sleep with in yeah. his cabin and study you <laughs> 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 look forward to that i'm sure yeah. um um so the, also re reference to the graph that you showed um in the cabin that richard slept in um do the bed bugs go back to where they were harboring before or do they find a new site so when they leave and find richard do they go back to that one place or do they tend to you, chill out in in the in the if there are markings usually he clean it's quite thoroughly so there should not be markings in in most but he has done some experiments and there they uh, maybe not the same individual go back to absolutely the same uh, uh, harborage, but they harborage in the same places. Uh, and Richard have done studies earlier where he had marked bed bugs uh, with different colors and seen that they are moving between harborages, but they definitely mm -hmm. go to harborage. They are not usually not staying on their own. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, just a, an added um, bit to my question about whether it's Cymex lectularis. Um, someone's asking in this, what strain of Cymex lectularis was, was it that you used? This year yeah. was a London field strain. Uh, in in the experiments with the uh, different densities, and uh, Richard had used various strains in the experiments he have done. Uh, Swedish. Mm -hmm. English or yeah, from various places, various but places. they are all uh, strains that have not been in the lab for too long. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, did you find there was any any preference on the types of monitoring traps that were effective, or maybe even in insecticide that was is it mostly effective active ingredients for bitter bugs, or was that not really something that you study? I'm not into so much into the poison, I'm more diatomaceous earth second, uh, but uh, I, I think the most important thing is to have a good uh, constructed uh, trap and also with the, okay, with the European uh, regulation, you cannot have a, uh, like you cannot have diatomaceous earth to, together with a lower uh, so you have to be clever in how you may use the two things together if you want to mm -hmm. kind of uh, pin, 
get the bed bug to move because you yeah. cannot combine the two because then the, oh you can but then you have to go into a totally different set of uh, mm -hmm. uh, what do you say uh, to be allowed to to do that and uh, that that really takes uh, money and time uh, yeah. to get that I haven't seen it uh, anyone doing it because yeah, I would sometimes say ridiculous uh, when I'm talking about diatomaceous earth. What you mm -hmm. what you should do to to get permits and so uh, yeah, because Absolutely. it can that's vary kind of substance. Of... If you're going with with uh, uh, artificial chemicals, uh, pesticides and so, I can understand that uh, there are yeah restrictions and so and that's that it. Different from it. Sweden to, to UK as well, and you know, yeah, yeah we've got to yeah. take those in consideration. Um, fabulous. We're we're a couple of minutes over, but I don't really care because it was a great subject, and I wanted to get the questions in. Um, and yeah, we've really appreciated having you here today um, and joining us um, from there. And again, I know lots of people, lots of comments that are coming out. It was a fantastic presentation. So thank you, Jet. Yeah, much thank, appreciated thank you for, for letting me. Of course, anytime, anytime. <laughs> we'll have you back. Don't worry. We'll have you back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.